Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, good morning sinners. Good morning. Glad that you're all here today. It's the third Sunday of Advent, as we have been informed. And like each Sunday in Advent, there is a traditional theme. Uh, this first, uh, the first week, obviously, we talked about hope. The second week with Pastor Sergey last week was peace. This week, we talk about joy. That's our focus. Advent becomes a time where we have to ask ourselves, you know, do we have hope? Do we have peace? Do we have joy that Jesus offers? That's why it brings us back to him all the time. And if not, then what do we do? What do we need to do to find it so that we can truly be ready to celebrate Christmas? You know, it's interesting as I reflect on the Christmas story, I'm always remembering the Roman world into which Jesus was born. It reminds me actually of the dire straits or dire situation in which we find our own world here. If uh, you've been following the news, even today, tensions with North Korea are troubling. It's escalating. The rhetoric on both sides seems to be going off. Germany, a long-considered stable global power, is facing political turmoil, especially with the rise of the influential right-wing sources. The United Kingdom, if you've been following the news again, is trying to grapple with the fallout of Brexit. There's a plight of a half a million uh, Rogina refugees in Bangladesh. There's also the famine and the war in Yemen that's going on. At the same time, we look at the sexual harassment crisis uh, with people in positions of power throughout North America, brazen shoplifting within our own city, never mind unprecedented drug abuse, and yet more signs of darkness in our time and more signs for our need of redemption, is there not? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like this cheer of Christmas is forced upon us. Uh, It's spread on us so thick. Uh, It's clearly designed, though, to stimulate the economy, right? And and, uh, it's it's like the whole of our Western culture is built on, on being nice and making ourselves happy, Right? It's, it's almost like Christmas time and it's all suddenly on steroids. And if we're, you know, looking for something beyond happy, then we're obviously deluded in some respects. And if for some reason we aren't happy at this time, whether we're grieving or struggling with depression or wondering how to pay for all those Christmas presents or hoping just to even have enough money for Christmas dinner or just not feeling the cheer, if you get what I'm saying, then something's got to be wrong with us. And I reflect, and sometimes I think that in the church at large, we sometimes don't do a very good job of acknowledging the realities in the world. You know, we talk about hope, we talk about peace, we talk about joy, right, and and love. But do we also talk about the hard things that are happening in the world, like the violence, like things like tragedy, things like the refugee crises, things that defy our understandings? And and too often we, we don't. You know, I think the church at large, sometimes we tend to gloss over them and and focus instead on the brighter or happier stories, right? Because we need that. And then we wonder why people worry about whether they'll be welcome in church. Is it because we don't acknowledge the pain and suffering in the world? Instead, we just say to people, hey, just be joyful, you know? But how can anybody tell us their stories? How can they talk when they're mourning? How can they talk about it when they're living with depression? How can they talk about losing their job or just scrambling to make ends meet? You know, to, to deny what is happening in the world is not a Christian response. It's the opposite of a Christian response. In fact, Jesus never told us not to tell the truth about life. He never told us to only be happy or carefree all the time. You know, Jesus just wants us to be happy. Oh, okay, that's nice. Instead, Jesus told us to bear each other's burdens, to tell the truth, to stay near to those who suffer. And it's actually one of the reasons why we have our blue Christmas gathering here next Thursday, the December 19th, here at Seoul, at 7.07, in case you didn't know. Because we know that hard things happen. And that sometimes it might feel like there's no room for that in the Christmas season. But let's be honest, sometimes the holidays are just plain hard. 
And that we understand that we need to make room for that. And we do that here at Seoul, hence our blue Christmas gathering. And so whatever you're going through in life, you're welcome. You're welcome here in general. You're welcome to carry those things that are hard into this space, both on a Sunday and even up this coming Thursday. Because if you can't bring them here, where can you bring them? And at the same time, the church has an obligation. You know, there's this tension that's going on. and, and, And that is... Not just to acknowledge the brokenness in the world, which we have to do, but also to go one step forward and proclaim that it doesn't always have to be that way. You know, there, there is another way, and, and Advent actually begins to point to that, and, and, and we point with, with hope to the future. And we point towards this, this, this hope that Christ is going to be returning again. Today the, is what the mainline churches call uh, Godete Sunday. It takes its name from the Latin word Godete, which means rejoice. Now, again, in my office, if you were present at all this week, you heard everything from Gregorian chant, Twisted Sister, and uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Not to mention all the different fails, and and, uh, I was looking for something for joy regarding a video, and I decided uh, to edit that out, but that's okay. By the way, Chris, Twisted Sister's Christmas album is fabulous. you got to give it a listen. i just got to throw that out there. But uh, it's the Gregorian chant that, that got me going. Gaudete. It's, uh, it's the first word of the opening part of the liturgy for today's Mass in mainline churches. Gaudete. Rejoice. It comes from the passage, Philippians 4, 4-9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it or you can follow it on the screen with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, I love this, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. You know, it's, it's easy to understand why this text, that this is text is in why many mainline churches read it on this third Sunday of Advent. You know, who doesn't like to hear about joy this time of year? Christmas is almost here. We're to be joyful. But what about those times when joy feels hard to reach? So what do we say then? You know, Scripture doesn't promise us easy lives. It doesn't promise us lives without pain. But it does promise us that those things don't have the last word. And the best way to illustrate that is to really talk about the color of a candle. Go figure. You notice today's candle isn't purple like the other ones. It's obviously pink, like my t-shirt. I don't know if you can tell. See, that's pink. This is white. So there we go. Um, The traditional color for Advent in mainline churches is purple, and uh, that represents royal, like the coming of the Prince of Peace. But it's also, the purple represents prayer, um, repentance, and and preparation. And the churches, historically, used to take this very seriously. And four weeks before Christmas, for centuries, was actually very somber and penitent. Now, as the story goes, in the midst of those dark winters, churches thought about people need something a little bit more to give them a glimpse of what was coming. And so they made the third candle pink. Now there's a whole history behind it that I'll get to it when we talk about Lent, but you know, it's sort of a mix between the purple of Advent and the white of the Christmas candle in the center, right? You get, get that, you get that pink coming through. And it means that we're past that halfway point to Christmas you know, there's, like I said, there's more history here, and I'll get that when we're in Easter. But so that we light the pink candle because 
Just as the white mixes with the purple, it transforms it. And here we are, we're waiting. We're in this point of waiting for Christ's light to break into our world, to bring joy, that joy that sometimes feels so elusive in our society, does it not? And so we stand here in the real world at the junction where pain and hope meet. And we're looking for something better, are we not? I think, honestly, we all long for joy. It's there in the best of times. But may I present to you that joy is even there when times are hard. You can be a joyful person and still cry alongside the world. Because being joyful means you know it isn't supposed to be that way. And that you believe that, that it can be better. On Christmas Eve, we read these words from John chapter 1. It says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. In other words, Christ is the light of the world. And the worst that the world can do is still not enough to extinguish the light. And if that light can't be extinguished, then neither can that joy. And, and we are here because somewhere inside of us, we actually believe that's true. We believe that the light will always overcome the darkness. And we believe in the miracle that's about to come into the world. And so our job as followers of Jesus is to spread that light. To spread that joy. Because joy is different than just a feeling. Joy is is a way of living as people following the light of Christ into the world. Claiming joy is an act of faith, people. And living with that joy is an act of revolution in a world that could just use a little bit of joy right now. God's gift of joy is there for all of us to claim. Not just in the good times, but especially in the bad. We had a Hints family Christmas gathering, my wife's side of the family. And we sing carols. They force us to sing carols. I like rock and roll. So I did some prep because I'm talking about joy. Do you know that there are so many Christmas carols that don't contain the word joy? I was the naysayer last night. That song doesn't have the word joy. Like, Away in the Manger. Did you know that? I think Joseph got it wrong at one point. I think he asked to see the M-A-N-A-G-E-R, but somebody didn't know how to spell no, okay, anyway. The first Noel does not have the word joy. O little town of Bethlehem does not have the word joy. Silent night does not have the word joy. For you traditionalists, thou didst leave thy throne does not have the word joy. We three kings does not have the word joy. It came upon a midnight clear does not have the word joy. We wish you a Merry Christmas does not have the word joy. Just saying, just throwing it out there, okay? And yet joy is the key word in the biblical accounts of the birth of Jesus. Joy is at the center of the announcement of the birth to the shepherds and to the world and to us when you look at it. The shepherds, they represent the common people like you and me. In Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, we read that the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, this good news that the angel is talking about is actually a divine message from God. It's not an ordinary message. It's a message from the divine, a message that the people have, of Israel have been waiting for for thousands of years. And finally, the Messiah is here bringing good news of what? Great joy, not just joy, but exceeding joy, intense joy, overwhelming joy, a joy that we don't see very often today. And sometimes people use the words joyful and happy and blessed almost interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. On some social media, you can indicate your mood at the time of your post, right? With one of those little faces, right? It's, a, it, you know, it's there for you. you. You choose happy. It's a temporary mood based on any number of circumstances. Like whether you had your coffee in the morning or whether somebody, a friend called you. But yet happiness, when you actually think about it, is, 
is, is one of those sort of basic yet shallow feelings that we all have as human beings. It's part of that sad, mad, glad, you know, trio that never gets any deeper than the sur surface. How are you? I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm glad. It doesn't really matter. It's a surface. It's the kind of joy that the Bible talks about and calls us to seek isn't just happiness. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a cheerfulness brought out by the smell of, you know, cinnamon or cookies, you know, wafting down the hall or the thought of a jolly old elf bringing us new toys. That's not what it's about. Happiness, yes, is an emotion, but it can disappear as quickly as it rises to the surface. Joy, however, is a choice. We have a choice. And God gives us joy that is unconquerable. And we can choose to live in the attitude of resentment, in the attitude of anger, in the attitude of fear, or we can choose to pursue the joy of Christ. So then how do we get it, right? You got to think about it. Some of us have a hard enough time summoning up happiness or cheer by itself. Many of us at this time of year are frantically rushing around, getting everything decorated and wrapped and baked that we don't really have any time for Christmas cheer. And I wonder if we're truly honest with ourselves, how many of us would admit that we pretend to be happy even when we're not. At Christmas time or any other time. Because that's what people expect of us, right? We use our smiles and it actually masks something deeper down. You know, do we keep working on our happiness, hoping it will one day just, just be enough? Get back to the Christmas story and I look at Mary and Joseph and I wonder how cheerful they were that first day, that first advent. Mary, an unmarried teenager, suddenly pregnant, Joseph, a man who will be supporting a family even before he pays for a wedding. Both of them in a small village where everybody knows their scandal before lunchtime. In a culture where Mary's choice to say yes to God could have easily gotten her killed. And in the midst of that, Mary sings. And you can look, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. You know, if anybody had a reason to mask their, f their fear with false cheer, it was these two. It was really these two, yet in the face of both, they proclaim joy. Margareta Amayer said, Joy is an act of faithful subversion in a world that tells you to be scared and sad. Isn't that cool? Joy is an act of faithful subversion in a world that tells you to be scared and sad. Just read the news. Joy is well beyond anything our culture, our possessions, our country, our media, even our relationships can give us. Joy comes from one place, from seeking God. And interestingly, it seems that God has ever shown us the way to joy. Did you hear it earlier when we read the scriptures? Paul writes the words, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Where does he write them from? He writes them from inside a prison. We don't know which prison Paul was writing from here or when. Scholars guessed it was Rome, Caesarea, or Ephesus. But sometimes it seems like Paul's actually locked up more than he's actually free. The important thing to know is that Paul is locked up in prison when he's writing this. And prison back then were pretty much rat-infested, mildew-infested holes in the ground where you only got fed if you had friends who would bring you food. And from those conditions, Paul was telling a bunch of disciples in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always. Think about that. Author Anne Lamont talks about her preacher and mentions that he used to say this regarding this verse. He would always say, if you're going to rejoice, you have to have some joice to begin with. I kind of love that. 
If you're going to rejoice, you have to have some joyce to begin with. You have, you have to have you have to draw on the reserve of joy. You have to draw on it in order to rejoice. And the catch is that thing called joy doesn't come from within us. You know, you cannot manufacture joy. You can't buy joy. You know, but you can't even bottle it up. It doesn't come in pill form just in case you needed to go to the pharmacy. It has to be discovered. It has to be reached for. It has to be anticipated. It has to be leaned into. C.S. Lewis nailed it. He says, all joy reminds it is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. And elsewhere he writes, all joy emphasizes our pilgrim status, always reminds, beckons, awakens desires. Our best havings are wantings. And we have to understand that Paul doesn't tell us always to be joyful. That's impossible. Even Paul was not always joyful, but Paul does point us to the source where joy can be found, and he says it, in the Lord, in Jesus. For Jesus always calls us to follow him. Jesus always awakens a desire in us. We sang about that today. For, for that which was longer ago, further away, a garden where humans lived in harmony with God's good creation. We, we want that. We desire that. And for that which is about to be, which is this new heavens and a new earth that is promised in his return, where God dwells amongst the nations, where pain and death and prisons like the one that Paul is in are no more. Can you imagine those? And God wipes away the tears. Don't we long for that from every face? And Jesus bridges the two in his incarnation when he comes to earth in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his glorification. The promises God has made to this world and the people that dwell on it through Jesus are huge. The coming of Jesus awakens joy in us. That's what we're looking for, even when it's dark. In him we're given a truer a better, a more beautiful wantings, as Lewis says. We seek him, we reach for him, we lean into him, we anticipate him. And joy is the light that, that shines in our darkness, and that darkness doesn't extinguish it. See, Jesus is the light that never goes out. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known. When we read this passage, it's filled with Paul's favorite words. We have joy and rejoice. We have gentleness, as in let your gentleness be known to everyone. Then there's peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Joy, peace, gentleness. You know, does that sound like anything else that Paul wrote in the New Testament? Right? The fruit of the Spirit, the spirit in Galatians chapter 3. Let me remind all of us again that Paul is telling the Philippians about joy and gentleness from prison. Roman prisons aren't places of joy or gentleness. They're dark, damp, cramped with the condemned. The guards were usually soldiers deemed unfit for combat. And what happened is that they would take out their frustrations on the prisoners. If you were locked in stocks or chains, you sat in your own filth unless you had a friend who was willing to go into the prison and clean and change you. People died all the time in these prisons. They died from disease. They died from hunger. They died from exposure or even the guards just letting off steam. And so you have to imagine Paul, there he is. He's surrounded by stench and filth, despair and violence. Where do you find your joy? Moreover, where do you find the resources to be gentle when everything and everyone around you is a threat? <coughs> and Paul says, and again, I'll say this, it's an instruction. It's not a suggestion. Paul instructs us to let our gentleness be known to everyone. And yet we know it's dangerous, right? It's dangerous for us to, to let everybody know our gentleness. As a matter of fact, in our society, our culture, we only let a few people know our gentleness. And the, the word that Paul uses for gentleness means being willing to yield, to hold back, to, 
to choose mercy over judgment, to turn the other cheek. It's, it's a way of living in a world that actually requires strength, when you think about it, that requires flexibility, that requires generosity, that requires wisdom, but most of all, in a world that requires patience. And for all of you going to Costco today, this word is for you. And like joy, this gentleness, gentleness can't be manufactured. We have to choose to accept God's gift of gentleness. And we have to learn to accept the gift of God's gentleness when we joyfully receive his son in a manger. This vulnerable baby. The word that becomes flesh. And when we can receive that word become flesh, dying on a cross, rather than calling down 12 legions of angels to slaughter his enemies, that was the day God turned the other cheek. And when we trust that the, the empty tomb is actually God's promise to, to save not only us, but all his creation, our outlook changes. And when we receive those gifts with joy, we learn that we can afford to be gentle. Because in the birth, in the life, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus, God has already made his gentleness known to everyone. And because of God's gentleness, there's this light that shines in the darkness. And the darkness hasn't extinguished it. That light was even shining for Paul in the darkness of his prison. He could see it. And so with Paul, I invite you to rejoice. I invite you to be glad in the Lord always. For he's given us means to be gentle in an unforgiving world. And from prison, from his, his chambers of his earthly hell, Paul assures his friends in Philippi that they can rejoice and be gentle. Why? Because the Lord is near. In the Greek, Paul writes... And it's just three words, this whole curios ingus. But these three words are loaded. They're packed to the point of bursting. They're overflowing, overwhelming, flooded with promise. Ingus is one of those fun words that carries multiple connotation or hues. It means drawing near, both in time, that the, the Lord is nearly here, and it also means drawing near in space. In other words, the Lord is nearby. And the thing is, when Paul's writing this letter and he's saying, you know, drawing near, he's probably meaning both ways. And if you read Paul's letters, there's always this sense of expectation. There's always a sense of urgency for Jesus' return. He is ready. He's waiting for Jesus to come back. And I suspect that Paul was also saying that Jesus is also close to us. When you think about it as close as our next heartbeat, as close as the next breath we take or the next meal we eat. James said in his letter, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, if we reach out to Jesus, he gathers us up in his embrace. And so when Paul in prison reassured his Philippian friends that the Lord is near, he probably actually had Psalm 119, verse 151 in mind. The people who love to plot the wicked schemes are nearby, but you, Lord, are nearby too. You know, the earliest Christians, and we see this in Paul's letters and specifically in the book of Revelation, they took the psalmist's words of confidence and they transformed them into a motto. That motto is called Maranatha. Something between a boast and a prayer, because depending on how you, you say this phrase, it, it can mean either our Lord has come or come, O Lord. Now, Jesus didn't return as quickly as Paul anticipated, because we are still awaiting his coming. But that's what the whole season of Advent's all about. We live in the in-between time. Psalm 110 is probably the most quoted passage in the New Testament, the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. And we inhabit the time and space that this psalm 
describes. It says, the, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, until I make your enemies your footstool, as it continues on. We live, we move, we have our being until time. And so even in that process, even in that waiting, Paul wants us to know that Jesus is always near. He's, he may not be here in his second coming, but he is near. Paul could see the light shining in the darkness. Even the darkness of his prison cell hasn't overcome it. And so Paul seeing that light sustains his joy, sustains his gentleness. And, and you need to be encouraged that it will sustain you as well as we wait for Jesus' return. Don't worry about anything. The Lord is near. This is what Paul is asserting. And even though it doesn't look like that, even when it doesn't feel like that, He's not far from any of us. And it's that truth which Paul connects, which actually connects Paul's invitation to rejoice and to be gentle to what he says next. And we hear it all the time in the New Testament. It's actually expressed in a variety of different ways, but it's definitely a refrain that's repeated throughout. We we read it in Matthew where it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. We read it in Luke where it says, Don't be afraid, little flock, for your father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. We hear, read about it in Peter where it says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You know, it's, it's not a call to irresponsibility. It's not an invitation to quit caring. It's not about the power of positive thinking. It's not even quite, you know, let go and let God. That's not what it's talking about. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, let's face it. I suspect that we are often afraid to let our guards down, right? To rejoice. To let our gentleness be made known to everyone. Why? Because I think we're always worried that we're going to be taken advantage of. Or that we're going to be blindsided by some sort of evil. Or maybe we're just anxious that, you know, we give too much too soon and we end up looking foolish. And Paul, from that dark, damp dungeon full of despair, didn't want his friends to be too worried about him. And he tells them to rejoice. He didn't want their gentleness replaced by any type of cynicism or mistrust or defensiveness. So he reminds them, look at the Lord is near. He's near to me. He's near to you. He fills that space between us. The Lord is near. So don't worry about anything. And then he'd say, rather, in everything by prayer, by supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Name your fears, name your grief, name your needs, name your longings. It becomes liberating when we begin to share that with God. But then don't worry about anything. Why? Because the Lord is near. Rejoice and let everybody know your gentleness. (coughs) There's a quote I found by Fernando Sabino once said this, and I love this. In the end, everything will be okay. But if it's not okay... It's not yet the end. Isn't that great? And this is more or less a version of Paul's lessons to us. Even if it's not okay, people. Even when we're surrounded by darkness. Maybe that's you this morning. Let me actually say this. Especially when we're surrounded by darkness. We must not worry. We're free to rejoice. And the others in the darkness with us need our gentleness. Everything was not okay with Paul when he wrote the Philippians. But he knew that uh, that just meant that it wasn't the end. And he reminds us that, that no matter how dark it is in this time of our waiting for everything to be okay, the light is still shining in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. Writing from prison, Paul's saying, rejoice, be glad, find your joy in the Lord. In Jesus, celebrate the promises God has made to us in the birth, in the life, the death, and the resurrection of his son. He says, let your gentleness, you know, let your gentleness, your tough, gritty, patient mercy. You got some of that? Let it be known to everyone. 
He says that we're able to rejoice in Jesus and live out this gentleness that we've learned from Jesus because we know that Jesus is near. He's just around the corner. He's as near as our prayers, but also needy and breathless and begging and ragged and maybe even sometimes through gritted teeth and growling prayers with salty language. Do you know of which I speak? We pray to him. You ever been there? Maybe you are there, and he's near. And Paul says that when we live rejoicing and gentle and prayerful and trusting that Jesus is near, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is not the absence of trouble. It is not living above the fray. It's not leaving everything behind. Remember, Paul writes from a prison, a moldy hole in the ground full of people sitting around in dark waiting to die. Peace is God keeping you sane and hopeful in this crazy world we live in. Whatever hole in the ground you happen to be stuck in today, God, peace, it overrides the fight, flight, and freeze mechanisms in our lives. Peace is God, God guarding our hearts and minds from hopelessness, from cynicism, from the desire to take matters into our own hands, from rage. And the peace of God is what happens to us when we can admit that everything is not okay. And we're not okay. But we're able to remind ourselves that if everything is not okay and we're not okay, then it's not the end. The peace of God is what happens when we see that light shining in the darkness and the darkness has not swallowed the light. And the light kindles what? It kindles a joy in us and we're able to rejoice in the Lord because we know that each day brings us closer to the time when that light that's been steadily shining in the darkness will swallow the darkness forever. That's Advent joy. That's joy, church. The joy that consumes our lives so that we also become light shining in the darkness that the darkness can't pull out. Joy is trusting when you want to doubt. Trust in the Lord forever. The Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. As Christ followers, we aren't pressured to do it all for everyone. We just trust in Jesus to do the heavy lifting. And the key word there is trust. We need to have Mary's response to the coming of Jesus. Where she says, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's slave, she said. May it be done to me according to your word. It's trusting. Joy is receiving what you want to reject. Can you imagine how the innkeeper would have felt if he said to Mary and Joyce, oh, you know, you can't stay in the stable. That's for paying customers. You know, what do you take me for? We find joy in making room for people in need, right? You know, reflecting on these words found in the book of Hebrews, don't neglect to show hospitality for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it doing something for people and joy is celebrating what you want to fear what's the first thing the angels say to mortals in scripture yeah it's it's actually standard protocol and i'm pretty sure that god always had an you know a, a class for angels when they had a divine encounter with human beings first thing all angels say to all mortals is fear not you know, you can see Jesus standing in front of the angels instructing them. Okay, guys, let's, let's go over this again. Most people, I tell you, you know, you're going to speak to them. They're going to be scared out of their wits. So let's practice this greeting one more time. All together, fear not, right? The message is clear. God is not looking to scare us into faith. Regardless of the movies that you watched in the 70s. He drew near to us to relieve the worries that we have about crossing over the divide between heaven and earth. And he wants you to know that he's going to take care of you no matter what happens. One of the names that 
He was called long before he ever stepped on the world stage as Emmanuel, God with us. So matter, no matter what you go through, we can whisper the simple truth. Jesus is with me. Think about that. He's with you in your greatest victories. He is with you in your most humiliating defeats. He is with you at all times in all things. I've personally used this passage of scripture in very dark times of my life. As a matter of fact, it was the only prayer I could actually pray at that time. I kid you not. And I don't know if you've ever been in that place because I have. You know, we were going through a, a multiple emotions when Sharon was pregnant with Josiah. And the tragedy of losing our son, it was actually this passage on joy when I had no joy, broken down into a simple prayer that kept me sane. And I'm going to share it with you, and I've done this with many other people before, and here it is. It's, this was my prayer on the screen, please. Anxious and nothing. Prayer in anything. Thankful. Sorry, prayer in everything. Thankful in anything. And peace. Anxious in nothing. Prayer in everything. Thankful in anything. Peace. Will you say it with me? Anxious in nothing. Prayer in everything. Thankful in anything. Peace. I can't tell you how many times I just had to sit on the word peace. Maybe you're here today and you're going, Jerry, I need that. I, I need joy. I need the joy that Jesus gives. I need peace. I just need his hand upon my life. I want to be able to pray with you in a moment. As a matter of fact, if everyone, just bow your heads with me, please. And you're here this morning, and you don't know Jesus. I'm going to be very clear on this one. You don't know Jesus. And you're just at that point where you need that joy. You need that freedom. You need that forgiveness. You just need somebody to pray for you. If that is you, just put your hand up and put it down. That's all I ask you to do. Yeah, thank you. For the rest of you, it's that time of year. You maybe, maybe you hate the Christmas season. Maybe you love the Christmas season, but maybe you're just not feeling it. Maybe you're just overcome with everything else. Maybe joy is the last thing that you have in your life. And you just need a refreshment of God upon your heart, upon your life. If that's you, just put your hand up and down and allow me to pray for you as well. Will you? Yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to respond and you couldn't, there's going to be a phone number that's going to go up on the screen. All you have to do is text the word soul to that number. Our pastoral care team will follow up with you. We want to talk with you. We want to answer your questions. We want to be able to pray for you. And we're here for that. We're here for you. You also have an info card at your seat. You can fill it up, drop it off in the joy basket, or give it to the welcome desk on the way out. In the last few weeks, over 10 hands have went up to accept Christ as their Savior. We have these little books. Maybe you didn't get yours yet. It says, My New Life with Jesus. Pastor Jordan McClellan will be at the cross on my right. Your left, he'll have this for you. It's our gift for you. So if you've responded, if you want to know more about Jesus or anything else, we want to put this in your hand. It's free. You just take it and read it. And you have more questions, you contact us. Let's pray. God, I pray for those who put up their hand this morning that just really need to know who you are, Jesus. 
And I pray that you would open their eyes and their hearts to receive you and to, they would experience your forgiveness and your freedom from all things. I pray that you'd give them strength and courage to move in this newfound experience of faith. God, for the rest of us, we often place our trust in things that we can see, that we can touch and easily believe, but you didn't ask us to believe what's easy. You've asked us to believe what is true. So forgive us, God, when we doubt the ways that you work. Forgive us when we find it hard to believe an ancient story. Forgive us when we question how you chose to enter the world born as one of us. Forgive our lack of faith and belief in ways which seem so impossible to believe. God, help us to look in faith. Open our belief. Set aside our doubts that you sent your son, born of a virgin, the one who has come to set us all free. We offer this to you. And may we be anxious in nothing. May we have prayer in everything and thankful in anything. And may you bring us peace. Amen. Will you stand with me, please? In ancient time, we want to bless, extend his hands for a blessing. Those receiving a blessing did likewise. Here is your blessing today. Soul Sanctuary. Never put your faith in worldly status. Never underestimate your heavenly importance. So sanctuary, let your trust in the coming of Christ soar within you with wings of joy. Now, go out into the world and serve one another as God bearers. And may grace, may mercy, may peace from God our Creator through Jesus our Savior in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our nurturer, be with you this day and forevermore. So now go joyfully and live the church.